Welcome back to The Daily's Double Shot. I'm Tremisa Jackson. And I'm Austin Seedentoff. We've got a great show for you today. We'll kick things off with a tour of Rady Dog Radio's new studio. Then we'll check out the third annual women's gala held by the UW Women's Center. David Chrisman gives us the scoop on the latest James Bond movie, Skyfall. Bond. James Bond. We'll crash the hub election party. We check out the services offered at the Odegaard Writing and Research Center. And we take a look at the cool stuff you can do with 3D printing. All coming up on The Daily's Double Shot. Hey Austin, have you heard of Rainy Dog Radio? Oh yeah, I listen to their stuff all the time. Didn't they just move to the hub for a new studio? Yeah, let's check it out. The completion of the hub means another place for students to eat, buy supplies, or just hang out. But for UW internet radio station Rainy Dog Radio, it means a whole new studio. But what exactly is Rainy Dog Radio? We talked to their promotions coordinator, Vladimir Sepetov, to learn a little more. Rainy Dog Radio is UW's college radio station, student run, I think that's, I mean, we do, we provide a way for students to be able to um, play their favorite music, but also as a way to, like, uh, if you need announcements or a way to communicate with the broader UW student body and staff and everyone else. Uh, and it's just like a way to communicate with other groups, and it's just a fun way for people to get involved in the music industry as well. Cooped up in the basement of Condon Hall for the last two years, Rainy Dog now has a studio in the ASUW Plus section of the hub. The new facility is a roomy and welcome change. DJ Dean Hansen, known on the air as DH, gives us his take. I think we're definitely on the rise because we're now in the hub. We've moved out of the depths and the basement and the pits of Condon, so that was great to get out of there. And I feel like we have an amazing space now and people are starting to realize that we have a really awesome space. The result of years of discussion, the move to the hub, while welcome, did not happen overnight. Technical manager Bennett Schaaf tells us about some of the challenges of the move. In Conan Hall we had two rooms that were connected by a wire conduit. In the hub we have a smaller studio and then a larger, located within a larger office space and right now we can't drill any holes in the building, um, so wires have to go through the doorway, and we're kind of managing that. But a big, a big thing right now is setting up a permanent radio station, a permanent setup, because Condon, we knew we were going to be there for two years. The location in the hub not only means a better studio, but a more active role in the UW community. So we were we were in the basement of Condon for around three years, and that was just like hard for us because we were like really disconnected from everyone on campus and also other ASU Dub entities. So now we're like in the ASU Dub Plus suite in the hub. Uh, we have, we're like right across the hall from Arts and Entertainment. Um, and we just have a way better way of reaching students, which is really what we want to do. This year we're focusing a lot on like podcasting and ad spots um, and just ways to reach the community and do like pre-recorded show bits. Like anyone can come in and record something that they want to get broadcast. Uh, we're shifting away from it being like completely music centric uh, to being a little bit more broad um, and allowing anyone to like contribute to Rainy Dog. Rainy Dog Radio is always looking for new talent. Assistant manager Aaron Halligan, who takes part in Rainy Dog's hiring process, tells us a bit about what kind of people they look for. I think the main quality we look for when hiring volunteers is just like a passion for music. People who have like an individual like music taste and who don't really pay attention to what like popular music is at the current time, but just people who like really care about their personal music taste. Rainy Dog has a lot to offer. Whether you're an aspiring radio personality, a club making an announcement, or a local band looking to get on the air, Rainy Dog is worth checking out. We're figuring out a way to make it work, and that's kind of the Rainy Dog attitude. We're a bit scrappers, you know? We, we kind of have to fight fight to survive, but we, we have over 40 DJs this quarter, and they're all playing their shows every day of the week, except for Sunday, because the hub's closed. <laughs> Rainy Dog Radio's rad, and yeah, that's all I have to say. Yeah, Rainy Dog Radio, fam first. We doing it out here live. 
Number one, baby. I love you. Tune in by going to rainydog.org and hitting the play button. Well, that's pretty cool. I'm definitely going to keep listening to their stuff. Up next, we'll take a look at the third annual Women's Gala hosted by UW Women's Center, where they honored 11 Washington women who have impacted their communities. Sounds cool. Let's roll it. Uplifting women and bringing courage to the next generation. This is what the UW Women's Center is all about. And on the 3rd of November, at the third annual Women's Gala, we caught a glimpse of it. The event was held at the Fairmont Olympic Hotel in downtown Seattle. After dinner, a lovely program followed. The program was dedicated to honoring 11 Washington women. From retired Justice Poppy J. Bridge to Purple Rain, all the honorees were different. All had different backgrounds, experiences, and occupations, but they all shared the same common goal, to make the world a better place. While talking to Tracy Thompson, one of the honorees of the event, she had this to say. It's an incredibly important event because I, I think it's so important to, um, for, for women to feel that, that their efforts are, are valued. There are too few women in leadership roles in our country and, and to acknowledge the women in the state of Washington who are doing uh, incredibly important and exciting and very different work. So that the Women's Center does this kind of recognition I think really is an empowering thing for all women. Under Tracy's leadership, Teamsters Local Union 117 has played an active role in almost every major labor issue that has faced private and public sector workers in Washington. When asked why she's fighting, she said this. It seems like with the, with the middle class being under attack and working families struggling harder and harder to take care of each other, to, get, uh, to allow, have enough money to have a child go to college, uh, it's so important that we're, um, we're, we're fighting to make sure that everybody has the opportunities that I had. Tracy has become a big player in this region's labor movement and is dedicated to fighting every battle head on. From fighting labor union issues to fighting breast cancer, Tracy Thompson is a very dynamic woman and an inspiration. All of the women honored have powerful stories. When talking about the criteria for choosing the honorees, Claire Vanderotti, the chair of the event planning committee, had this to say. We asked a panel of advisory board members and friends of the University of Washington Women's Center to help us um, choose this year's honorees, and we gave them a certain set of criteria. We knew that we wanted to be supporting and recognizing women who were braving new horizons this year, women who uh, had innovative solutions to social and political problems. So we gave them those loose criteria and then we asked them to, to help us brainstorm women in the community who were making positive impacts and opening doors for women and girls. Choosing the guest speakers, MC, and honorees can be one of the hardest parts about planning the event. Another challenge faced by the UW Women's Center is funding. The Women's Center uh, three years ago decided to start hosting annual fundraisers in order to raise uh, the resources necessary to continue our programs and services. With the, with the budget cuts that were happening across the university, um, we actually had to start raising over 70% of our own funding. Um, it's kind of a misconception that because we're associated with UW, we are fully funded and that's not the case. This year, we, um, we were able to raise 143,000, which is fantastic given the current economic climate and uh, the fact that we've had this event three years in the running, so we are, we are thrilled with that contribution to our work. Even though it's a fundraiser, as Claire later states, it's much more than that. Our vision for the event is to celebrate women, celebrate women who are powerful, women who have a vision, women who um, have created innovative solutions to different issues that they're seeing in the society today. It's a celebration. I think a lot of fundraisers tend to get bogged down in the details and, and tend to focus on, on raising money. And while that's a critical part of our programming, um, more than ever in this climate, we need to be celebrating women and the work that they do. All in all, the Women's Gala for this year was a success. And if you attended the event, you probably left inspired and motivated to make a change. When asked what legacy does she want her work to leave with the community, Tracy replied. So my, my hope is that the work that I do um, penetrates people's lives in a way that they feel like they're valued and honored and uh, that there are people out there fighting for them. Uh, that's, that's, what I, that's the most important thing to me. Wow, that event was really snazzy. You know what else is pretty snazzy? James Bond. 
Well, let's just see how slick he is in David Chrisman's latest segment of Film Focus. Hello, I'm David Chrisman, and welcome to Film Focus. Today, we're looking at the most recent in a series of films that stood the test of time. It has existed over 50 years, and this is the 23rd entry. So let's take a look at Skyfall, and one of the most well-known protagonists in the history of film. Bond. James Bond. Skyfall is not a direct sequel to Quantum of Solace, like Quantum was for Casino Royale. Instead, some time has gone by and it looks like James is getting a little bit older. Skyfall is also a more personal story than other Bond movies, as this time the villain isn't out to take over the world or change life as we know it. All he wants to do is destroy MI6 and M, Bond's boss. As usual, the chase takes us around the globe, ending in a suitably Bond-like manner. The cast includes both returning characters and some new ones, with Daniel Craig returning as Bond, of course, and Judi Dench reprising her role as M. Joining them are Rafe Fiennes as the head of the Intelligence Oversight Committee, Gareth Mallory, Naomi Harris as another MI6 agent named Eve, and Javier Bardem playing the villain. You'll know who he is when you see him. Finally, there's Ben Winshaw as Q. Those of you who are bigger Bond fans will have noticed that I just mentioned that Q is making a reappearance something that hasn't happened since the Craig films began, a move to update the series, make it less campy. The return of Q marks somewhat of a change in the series overall. Skyfall is still anything but campy, especially to the degree that Pierce Brosnan films were, but it also acknowledges that history. Director Sam Mendes is obviously a huge fan of the classic films, since there's a lot of visual references to them, and some references in dialogue as well. Skyfall has the feel of a classic Bond film, something that I'm sure some people will love and others will hate. So Skyfall feels like it's an old-school Bond film, but at the same time, there are some definite problems with it. The editing isn't the best, sometimes making it unclear what's happening or who's involved in the shot. On top of that, the pacing is just bad. There are a lot of times the film feels disjointed and lurches a little bit in terms of what's happening. The first half of the film feels too long, and the way things are shot, once you're three-quarters of the way through the film, you feel like it's the end, but at the same time, it can't be, because that would be too short of a movie. On top of all that, Skyfall practically flashes the words Act 1, Act 2, Act 3 on screen when you reach certain points in the film. While to some degree this is unavoidable, the transitions between scenes are a little bit heavy-handed. Really though, Skyfall is a Bond film, with everything that entails. It's not high art or an extremely impactful statement about the world, but it is good fun. Its errors come from its technical aspects, and not from story ones, which is better than can be said for most Bond films. Daniel Craig and company perform as well as ever. I found that I'm quite starting to like Ben Winshaw, as he does a good job updating Q to the new formula. And Judi Dench is absolutely amazing in this film as M. Director Sam Mendes does an excellent job keeping the franchise up to date, as well as returning it to its roots. Skyfall is a film that's pulled in a lot of different directions, and though I found myself dissatisfied with it, I'm sure that Bond enthusiasts will welcome Skyfall with open arms. Skyfall is rated R, open today, and is an interesting addition to the old franchise. Last Tuesday, students from all across the political spectrum met in the hub to watch the election unfold together. Oh, really? What was it like? Well, let's watch. Hi, I'm Amelia Dixon, and I'm a reporter for The Daily. I'm here at the hub for the 2012 election viewing party. Let's go check it out. So I'm here with Angie Weiss, director of OGR. Angie, what are the big issues for you this election season? I would say, not only as that, but as myself, that higher education funding and funding for financial aid is one of the most important issues this year and every year, um, especially with Pell Grant funding at the federal level, something we're going to be watching pretty closely with this presidential race. Can you tell me a little bit about what your most important issues are this election season? Yeah, um, I think the most important thing, especially for students, is obviously education. Um, since we've had a competitive governor's race, um, the issue of education definitely has been on the forefront. And I think that's something that definitely has been on the minds of students. Um, on top of that, obviously, the economy is a big one. Uh, being in an institution of higher education, um, you know, we obviously are trying to get an education and we want to make sure that there are jobs afterwards uh, for us to fill, you know, the spots that obviously that we're trying to specialize in. I was in Red Square and I was holding up a sign for Referendum 74 because I really think everybody has the right to get married to whoever they want and be happy. Same-sex marriage is an issue because it's something that I believe in and fight for that equal, everybody has the right to, to marry who they, who they want and who they love. 
it's like even with straight couples like looking at your partner and just the idea that you can't be with the person you love so that's just how I think about it can you tell me which local issues hit closest to home for you I would definitely say green energy but aside from that, I think my number one is definitely the budget and financial issues. To me, the biggest issue is really making sure that students and um, people my age are getting out to vote and are really, really being educated when they're making their decisions this year. It's the first time I voted, so I thought it would be exciting to be with my fellow classmates and support our country. It's a lot of uh, support for OGR. This is a really big event for them. They're collaborating all within ASU Dev, um, and I really support everybody that's in this, as well as it's just the perfect opportunity to celebrate with all of the students um, our civil right and our civil duty to vote, and so it's just the perfect place to be able to um, experience this, this election season. There are a lot of election events going on in Seattle tonight. Why will you be here at the Hub? I would definitely be at the hub tonight because I can watch the election results with all of my friends and it's a really good time for students to meet each other and to talk about issues that are really important to them. You can also be together in one place and we can watch history be made this year uh, no matter what. Hey, Dre. Not now. I'm super behind on this essay and there's no way I'll be able to get it done on time. Okay, well first of all we're rolling right now and second of all you can just make an appointment at the Odegaard Writing and Research Center. Okay, well, you roll the clip, and I'll make an appointment. Works for me. It's well known that Odegaard Undergraduate Library is full of resources available to both students and faculty of the UW. But one that many students here at the UW are unaware even exists is the Odegaard Writing and Research Center, located on the third floor of the aforementioned Odegaard Undergraduate Library. It's here where students are welcome to make an appointment with a tutor and receive assistance on any writing project they might be working on. The Writing Center has been going through massive expansion recently, with 64 tutors and over 13,000 available appointments on the academic year. The Double Shot was able to sit down with OWRC Director Jenny Halpit to learn more about the services OWRC has to offer to the UW community. The Odegaard Writing and Research Center is a free service that's available to all UW students, staff, and faculty. We offer peer tutoring for anyone working on writing here at UW. So basically we say if it's writing, it's fair game. We invite people to bring in whatever it is they're working on. Um, maybe it's an assignment for a class, but maybe it's a presentation for a conference. Maybe it's an article for publication. Maybe it's an application for graduate school or for a job or internship. The versatility of the OWRC is truly what sets it apart from other writing workshops. We were also able to chat with OWRC coordinator Cammie Dodson about how the OWRC does more for UW students than just help improve their writing skills. I would say the goals of the OWRC are to, one, create a space where people across campus are welcome with sort of whatever they're working on in terms of academic or personal uh, professional goals and, and kind of having a place to explore that and express it in like a non-judgment-y way like no one's getting graded here this is entirely just a space that's meant to be kind of cultivating people's voices and helping them express what they want to say and how they want to say it in just two years' time, the ODBRC has managed to quadruple the number of students coming into the center due to both outreach and increased funding from the College of Arts and Sciences. Another perk of more funding is more tutors, such as Rachel Brown, who also serves as assistant director of the OWRC. We talked to Rachel about some of the responsibilities of a tutor working in the OWRC. So as a tutor, our main job is to be a a reader for other people's writing and so that means that um, basically people will come in, we'll sit down with them at any stage in the writing process, go through what, figure out what it is that they're concerned about in their paper and then kind of go from there, figure out what they need to work on. So next time you're feeling stressed out about a writing assignment you have due, don't panic. Head over to the Odegaard Writing Research Center where Jenny Halpin and her team of tutors are right there with you. Wow, I can't believe I finished that essay. Now all I have to do is print it. Why don't you print it in 3D? Are you trying to talk about the 3D printing piece? Yep, because up next we have a segment on a burgeoning 3D printing community here at UW. 
One of the UW's most interesting clubs is also one of its newest. WOOF, which stands for Washington Open Object Fabricators, started this last April and meets every Friday in the Mechanical Engineering Building on campus. We stopped by to speak with President Mark Genter and Director Bethany Weeks. Well, in some interesting things about the club is that it doesn't draw just from the mechanical engineering department. We've got students from computer science, electrical engineering, biology, art. There's been a very broad interest in the, in the group. It's not just the engineers that are coming in to work on 3D printers. So that's, that's what the group's all about, is just the 3D printing in general, its use, and developing technology. 3D printing uses an imaging program to print material one layer at a time until the desired object is complete. The technology for the printers themselves is open source, meaning everyone can access it and use it as they wish. The use of recycled and salvaged material is one of the most enticing aspects for the use of 3D printing, whose main material is currently a specialized plastic that is available from only a few special vendors. With the cost of material currently around $20 a pound, the use of waste plastic would be ideal. Earlier this year, the club claimed the honor of creating the world's first printed boat. The boat was printed entirely out of salvaged milk cartons. So we finished printing it like a day before the race and took it over to uh, Lake Washington to give it a test and it paddled beautifully. It was great. If you would like a 3D printer, the club also sells kits and offers assistance. For $300, you can own your own 3D printer about the size of a shoebox. And again, since the technology is open source, you could even print the parts for another 3D printer, so you never have to worry about repairs. What would you print? Well, that's all we got for you today. Tune in on Fridays at 7 p.m. for more episodes. You can also check us out online at youtube.com slash the daily. I'm Austin Seatentoff. And I'm Trinista Jackson. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you next time. On the Daily Double Shot.